Hey everyone, so today we're going to have a look at polymers in terms of the first year content. So when it comes to polymers, so polymers is just a technical term for what you'd call plastics. So when it comes to the actual exam, what you're going to need to know are what the four different groups of polymers are and their properties. To be able to give examples of each one of those for that group and what they'll be used for. What additives are and then what the different symbols on the recycling table would mean as well. So, I know a second ago I just said there are four groups of polymers. Um, what we're going to talk about first of all actually is the three main groups of polymers. So typically when you say how many groups of polymers are, really the answer is three. The fourth one is sort of a cheap one, that's sort of a new modern one we'll talk about in a second. So with your thermosetting plastics, these are the ones that cannot be recycled. So they're very heat resistant. Now the reason they can't be recycled is if you look at a molecular level, you've got your plastic, fi your polymer fibres going across, but then in between each fibre you've got your rigid cross links. Now these are called your van der Waal bonds. Now what will happen is once you've set it in place, they become rigid and it will stop you from being able to recycle them. That doesn't mean you can't reheat them again, although they have got good heat resistance. What will happen is it will just sort of go into a clumpy mess and become useless. Your next one is the thermoplastics. So if you have a look at the molecular level of it, so you've got all your fibres going across, but you don't have any rigid cross links. Now that means it's really easy to mould into shape and it can be recycled without too much difficulty. Um, now what will happen if you recycle it too many times, eventually it will start to break down, but it can be recycled quite a few times. And then your third group is your elastomers. So these can be either thermoplastics or thermosetting, depending on which one you're using. But typically they're just good, good elasticity. Um, so basically you can deform it, let go, and it'll go back to its original shape. It's a good idea to be able to draw these diagrams out to help explain your answers. So, thermoplastics. So what I'm going to do for each one of these groups, basically I'm going to talk about the most common ones that come up in exam questions, the properties for them, and then what I'd like to do is pause the video and have a go at trying to come up with possible uses for them. Because what will happen in exam questions Typically, it will give you a picture of a plastic product. It will ask you to suggest an appropriate material and then say why it's appropriate. Now, the best way to do that is look at the properties, or look at the use, sorry, and sort of figure out what properties it needs. So, if you take, for example, a uh, plastic garden chair. So, you know, right, think outside. So, it needs to be good weather resistance, good chemical resistance, needs to be hard wearing. Uh, it needs to be resistant to UV light. So what you can then do is look through all the property list and see what um, plastics match up to those properties. So that's a really good habit to get into, to sort of, if you're not sure, figure out, going backwards, what kind of plastics you need to look at. So I won't go through all of them, because obviously you can make notes as you're just going through, but once I'm done, if you pause the video, try and match up the, uh, the uses for each one, please do use the textbook, page 30, so LDP, low density polyethylene. Now for all of these, you don't need to know or give, sorry, the chemical name for them in your answers. You can just use the abbreviation. That is absolutely fine. So LDP is very tough, good chemical resistant, and waterproof, uh, weatherproof, sorry. HDP, same thing, weatherproof, tough, good chemical resistance. Polypropylene, PP, good chemical resistance, tough, good fatigue resistance, so it doesn't wear around. Hips, your high impact polystyrene, hard, rigid, tough. Your ABS, extremely tough, extremely rigid. Uh, PMMA, which is actually the technical name for acrylic. So that's actually the proper name for what acrylic is. is tough, hard, good chemical resistance. Nylon, which is tough, corrosion resistant, good temperature resistant, and low coefficient of friction, which basically means if it rubs, it's not going to wear out very well. Uh, UPVC and PVC. So the big, big key difference between those two is that UPVC is rigid, it's solid, and PVC is flexible. Now it's important to note that the C in PVC does stand for chlorine, so what will happen is if you uh, use PVC in a method that heats it up and produces gas, that is dangerous, that's why you can't laser cut PVC because it produces chlorine gas which can be deadly. So, pause the video. See if you can look through the properties and think of some possible uses. Please do use your textbook if you wish to. So next we've got your elastomers. So these are the ones that can be either thermoplastic or thermosetting plastic, depending on which one you're looking at. Um, we're page 32. So what you're looking at, so you've got 
natural rubber, which is high tensile strength, it's good to be pulled apart. Um, it is a good electrical insulator and good cold resistance. You've got neoprene, which is good thermal resistance and good uh, toughness and chemical resistance, so that's why it's used for things like uh, wetsuits, dry suits, good abrasive resistance, which is why it's sometimes it's used in uh, moto uh, GP, like leathers and things like that, so people on motorbikes, so if they were to crash and go across, it would stay in part, which is sort of the opposite of silicon, so you see silicon has poor, where does it say, it says uh, poor abrasive resistance, so basically if you were to just like get some sandpaper or like just abrasive paper or anything along that it will just disintegrate silicon quite easily so for those can you again pause it see if you can figure out what uses each one of those elastomers has so then you've got your thermosetting plastics so these are the ones that cannot be recycled because they set in place so you've got your urea formaldehyde which is hard good heat resistance good chemical insulator it's quite brittle so if you were to hit it it would shatter your melamine formaldehyde, which is hard, opaque, tough, food safe and chemical resistant, which is why it's typically used quite a lot in kitchen counters and things like that. Uh, your polyester resin, uh, which has got good heat resistance, good chemical resistance, but it's quite brittle. And then your epoxy resin, which is clear, hard, tough and chemical resistant. Now you may have seen quite a lot of videos recently of people doing like river tables where they're like getting pieces of wood and pouring resin into it where it's very very beautiful but it is terrible for the environment so again if you can pause it see if you can come up with possible uses for each one of those thermo sets so once you've got your polymer in the manufacturing process what you can do is you can add something called additives to the polymer before it's manufactured into something to change the properties now depending on what you're doing depends on what additive you might add so there is a whole theory coming on additives, so there'll be a whole video on it. So I'll just touch on it lightly for you now. So these are the most common ones. So things like fillers, what that does that reduce the weight and the cost. So say if you're making plastic garden chairs, but you it doesn't matter if it's not the best quality, you want to make as many as possible for the little amount of plastic as possible, you'd add fillers to it to bulk up so you had more plastic available. Flame retardant reduces the risk of it combusting, going up in flames. Uh, so making sure if it's something that's got to be near a heat source, make sure it's got a good flame retardant in it. Plasticizers increase its flow. Now that literally means its ability to pour. So if you are, say, injection molding a plastic chair and it's not forming very well, you might need to increase the flow a bit. So you might add a plasticizer. So when you pour it into it, like it gets injection molded, it'll go into the mold really easily. It stabilizes. Now they will stop something from breaking down with UV light, with sunlight. So again, plastic garden chair you might add stabilizers to it so it doesn't fade it doesn't break down pigments they'll let you change the colors of it your anti-static so that will stop uh, plastic from getting staticky and attracting dust because what it'll do is it'll attract a tiny little bit of moisture so dust can't stay on it and then your bio batch will allow polymers like pe or pp to biodegrade so what you've got here is the recycling table. Now, hopefully you've seen this before. You may not have seen the table before, but you may have seen these symbols before. Now, all plastic products will have these triangles, these symbols, imprinted on them some way. So if you've got a plastic drinking bottle, if you look at the bottom of it, make sure the lid's on it first before you turn it upside down, you will find it's got the one with a triangle around it. Now, the triangle's called the Mobius loop, and what this table does is basically explain how well something can be recycled one being the best and seven being the worst so if something is a six or a seven it's not going to get recycled it's just going to sit in a landfill and stay there for thousands and thousands of years but it's important that on there so that us as consumers and also people at recycling plants and manufacturers know what they are using because sometimes it can be quite difficult if you're just looking at a plastic product if it doesn't have any symboling like symbols on it you don't necessarily know what you're looking at so most plastics come from oil now oil obviously is a non-renewable it's a finite resource and we are going to run out of it at some point in our lifetime now thermoplastics are recyclable but again as we said if you recycle something too many times eventually it's going to break down so 
the problem we have then, in theory, we just going to run out of the ability to produce plastic. Now, we live in a society where most of the things we use is made of plastic in some way. So, what we're doing now is looking at the fourth type of plastic. So, to begin with, I said there were four types. Then I, like, I said on lying there's really three. So, your thermoplastics, thermosetting, and your elastomers. The new sort of fourth group of polymers is your renewable, your biopole plastics. So, these are ones that are either extracted from plant or animal extracts or they are synthetic and they come from chemicals and they come from a lab where they've been produced. So typically you can get latex rubber from rainforest so you can tap and get the uh, sap from the inside and produce it that way. You've also got things like PHA, PLA and PHB. So the most common ones are the ones on this table here, so on page 34. Again, like with the other ones, I'm not going to go through each one individually, but we'll go through some of the key ones, and then if you can pause it, see if you can figure out what possible uses for them. So, something like potato pack, which is natural, made from potato starch, that's typically now being used quite a lot in disposable cutlery and plates. You have got things like cornstarch polymer, which is made from starchy vegetables like corn and potatoes and maize. Uh, and you've then got things like PLA, which is made from corn kernels or sugar, corn sugar, to produce uh, lactic acid. And then that acid is then synthesized to produce uh, polymers. So that is why that is then synthetic, because that is produced acid that's then been synthesized. That whole process makes it a synthetic polymer. So basically anything that comes from natural sources is entirely a natural thing. Anything that is required, anything to be like, extracted and synthesized, that then becomes a synthetic polymer. So same thing, can you pause it, see if you can match up possible uses for each one of those. Okay, so now we've had a look at the four main groups of plastics. Can you, for just the images on the board, can you figure out what plastics they'd be made from and why? And if you can, can you say how they'd be made? Now I haven't covered manufacturing processes in this theory because that's a whole separate theory that would take too long to cover in this video. So pause it, see if you can see what they'll be made from. So your first one, your plastic bottle, will be PUT, which will be that one in the recycling table, which will be blow moulded. Your plug socket will be urea formaldehyde, which will be compression moulded. Your portable power drill will be ABS, which will be injection moulded. Your yoghurt pot will be PS, which will be vacuum formed. Your window frames would be UPVC, which will be, uh, PVC, which will be extruded. Your lime bent bits of plastic would be PMA, which their most common name is acrylic. Your plastic bags would be LDPE, which would be calendaring. And then your kayak will be HDPE and rotational moulding. So last thing, I've got eight questions on there. What I would like you to do is, again, can you please pause the video? Can you try and answer those questions for me using your notes and the textbook? And then I'll put the answers on there for you as well. So that is an introduction to polymers. If you've got any questions, if you send me an email, I'll either respond to the email or what I might do if there's a lot of the same request is I'll make another video tutorial to explain it so that everyone can see it as well.